<laughs> All right. So let's have a opening prayer for Romans. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless and praise you that uh, you have given us the gift of your word, that you meet us there according to your promise, that your Holy Spirit opens our eyes and our hearts to um, what you have for us. We beg of you that we would be uh, open to receive all of the gifts you have for us this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are at hymn 710. Um, the Lord's my shepherd. I'll not want him 710. So. Once upon a time, I had a pick on this guitar. I guess I'll just figure it out. The Lord's my shepherd. Verses 14 to 18. All right. So let me uh, get this one up. Oops. So let's go. Right. Good. Okay, so here we are. Excellent. So as we kind of work our way through here, Romans chapter nine. Let's arrive at here. And um, 
the Apostle Paul is is in a conversation, right? Um, that kind of reviewing how God has worked through people's lives and some he some are there that are part of that whole salvation history and others are not and in some respects we see at least like in the section just ahead of this those descendants of Esau had thoroughly rejected um, God's grace that they we don't want anything to do with it um, and we're going to kind of see that same kind of idea travel on here in this next section and that you know throughout this chapter it raises that whole idea of um, what we would call um, election by grace or predestination or that kind of an idea so starting at verse 14 um, he's going to turn a little different direction here he's been with Abraham and Isaac and so forth and Jacob in verse 14 what shall we say is God unjust not at all for he says to Moses I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort but on God's mercy for the scripture says to Pharaoh I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he will harden whom he wants to harden. Oh, boy. What does all that mean, right? Well, let's begin to unpack that just a little bit. God is just. What does that mean? The catechism definition is God is always fair and impartial in his ways. He has one standard. Everybody's judged by the standard. There are not, well, God, you know, because. No gray areas. No gray. <laughs> Black and white. Very clear, right? Now, we also know that God is merciful. And we're going to pick that up as we go along here. We do need to wrestle with this fact, though, that God is just. Impartially, what do I as a sinner deserve from God? Nothing but his wrath. Death now and eternal damnation. And sometimes it's hard for us as God's people to kind of fully embrace that prickly little thing right it's kind of like hugging a cactus it's just like no yeah, this hurts i don't want to do this and yet here it is and so one of the things that that paul is doing here is he's going back to moses and we'll take a brief look here at exodus right moses in this instance is up on the mountain again right and meaning again, you know, in Exodus 32, he's been up there for 40 days, 40 nights. And in the meantime, toward the end of that period of time, um, the people come to Aaron and they say, hey, we don't know what happened to Moses, this guy who brought us out of Egypt. Make us God. Because Moses is gone. We need some kind of leadership here. So make us God. So uh, Aaron says, give me your gold ornaments, which they're wearing, which often were connected to idolatry whoops um <laughs> you know um and he fashions this golden calf um god up on the mountain is saying to moses leave me alone in my wrath that i can destroy them i'll make a nation out of you moses knows better than to appeal to god on the basis of the character of the people of israel if you read exodus 32 his appeal is to god's character your enemies will hear of this God and they will say he could not bring them into the land so he destroyed them all in the wilderness. And so God relents, right? Moses comes down the mountain, sees what's going on. He is... Maybe. That, would, that would be a good way to put it. He is just 
righteously angry beyond belief. Um, he calls the Levites to him. They chop a bunch of people up. He then grinds up the golden calf, puts it on their water supply, and makes them drink it, which is one of the ways you dispose of a false god. Um, if you think about that process, it goes into the body and then it comes out. And that's what you're saying about that God, right? Um, if, you, if you get that image. Um, and ultimately, when he confronts Aaron, because Aaron is three years older than Moses, you wonder, well, why didn't God use Aaron as the leader, right? When he confronts Aaron, he says, well, you know these people. And by the way, I took this gold and I threw it into the fire and this calf walked out. Oh, my. Uh, we could go down the hall in preschool and get much better stories, right? <laughs> if we think about this. Calf walked out of the fire. There we go. Yep. Um, that's what's going on. So in 33, right, um, you know, the, the reality is, is this, is part of the initial consequence <coughs> in 33, God says to Moses, he's back on the mountain, leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt, that's a curious phrase, isn't it? It's like, you brought him up here, Moses, not me. <laughs> it's kind of like, I think God is just pushing Moses just a little bit to trust him a little deeper. But anyway, go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham and Isaac, etc., etc. Um, I'll send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, you know, and so on. Go up to the land flowing, but I will not go with you because you are stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. So God is very clear that I have these absolute standards. They don't change, right? Um, when the people heard these distressing words, right, because Moses kind of relays this to them, you know, they begin to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. Ah, there we go. Um, for the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites who are stiff-necked people, if I were to go with you for even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped their ornaments off of Mount Horeb. And again, a lot of those are connected with idolatrous worship. In other words, it's another way of God saying to them what he said earlier when he gave the Ten Commandments. No other gods. Come on. Just me relationship with me so ultimately um you know if we skip up to verse 12 here um this was a consequence moses saying to the lord you've been telling me lead these people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me you have said i know you by name and have found favor with you if you are pleased with me teach me your ways that i may know you and continue to find favor with you Remember that this nation is your people. So Moses is appealing to God on the basis of his character and his promises. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses, then there's another request. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go up with us. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? And the Lord responds to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. So ultimately, what Moses is saying is he's again humbling himself before God and saying, I can't do this without you. By the way, God, these are your people. By the way, God, how will the whole world know that you are the one true God unless you go with us? So you catch the nature of that? And I think sometimes in our prayer life, you know, Lord, we are your people. We beg of you, you know, to be fully present with us. Help us to know your ways so we may more deeply walk with you. It really is about relationship. Then Moses goes, show me your glory, right? Um, and the Lord basically says to him, I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you 
and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, ultimately, he does this in a different way in the sense that he says, as a sinful human being, you cannot see my face. So he puts him in a cleft of a rock and, you know, puts his hand, if you will, over him so he can't see his face. And he removes it so he can see his back. Now, what all that looks like, I don't know. But recognize, as God's people in Christ Jesus... We can see the face of God, right? Now, isn't it curious that even in light of this, what does in numbers God tell Aaron to do in terms of blessing the people? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his what? Face shine on you. Lifting up one's countenance is another way of saying face, right? Right? So it's ultimately, I think what God is demonstrating to Moses here is, and to us, is the only way to see that face of God is as we stand as his dearly beloved child in Christ Jesus. Because in that state, all of my sin has been taken away. In that state, I am holy and precious in his sight. The other thing that's really kind of interesting or fascinating is there is a sense in the Old Testament, and I, I haven't chased down all the passages on that, but there's a sense in the Old Testament that to see the face of God is to experience his presence and his joy. Right? Got to go. Yeah, I got a double duty today. Okay. <laughs> so I want to come for a little bit. So, um, yep, take care. Um, so ultimately, there's, there's kind of a lot tied in here. If we go back to that statement, though, I will have mercy on who I will have mercy, right? And I will, um, um, oops, I lost my, there it is. And I will have compassion on whom I, who I have compassion. That God is in effect saying, I'm God, right? This is part of who I am. How, why I do one thing and not another is beyond your ability to comprehend. It's just that simple. And, and we're going to see that as we go on here. Part of the application here is this idea that if God had acted only in justice during the golden calf in incident, all the people of Israel would have been destroyed, except for Moses. And it could be that Joshua was up there close by on the mountain with him. All right. If God acts only in justice toward us, there is no hope. And so part of it is recognizing when we have questions about God, why are you allowing this? Or why are you allowing that? Or what, you know, we can back up a step and say, wait a minute. I'm living in his mercy. And there's nothing in the scriptures that says we can't question God on those things. We've got to be careful, though, that our questions don't become demands for an explanation. Now we've crossed the line. Or that our questions don't become, God, you really should do this. And now we're trying to be the God of God, right? <laughs> Whoops. Um, yeah, I think at some level or another, I think all Christians have at least had those thoughts. We might not have verbalized them, but you know, God, why don't you just, you know, um, and, and he's aware of our frailties in that respect. So ultimately, as, as we kind of walk through this, um, you know, this idea of, of verse 15 here, I'm going to have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. As we look at what Luther says on Romans 9, 15, for he says to Moses, and we've got that verse there, this is what Luther says, this means I will give grace in time and life to him concerning whom I purposed from eternity to show mercy. 
On him I will have compassion and show mercy. On him I will have compassion and forgive his sin in time and life, whom I forgave and pardoned from all eternity. All right, so in effect, from God's perspective, before he ever said, let there be light, right, and created the heavens and the earth, it was all laid out before him as present. And, and in, in one respect, or let me rephrase that, in a way that I don't understand for God, all what we call time is now. He sees it all. From the beginning of creation until Jesus returns and there's a new heaven and a new earth created. He sees it all, right? Well, he sees beyond that too. But the point is, is the time that we live in is clear to him. So before God ever said, let there be, our names were written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay. And, and now it's like, when we try and logically understand that, it's going to lead us to places we really don't want to go. <laughs> okay. Or cannot effectively go theologically and stay true to the scriptures. And so in effect, what Luther is saying in all of this is that, you know what? The grace that I'm going to give to you in your life here on earth, right? I already knew from eternity I was going to do. And so that's what I'm doing, right? And ultimately, Luther then goes on in doing this, God is not unjust, for so he willed and was pleased to do from all eternity. And his will is not bound by any law or obligation. God's free will, which is subject to no one, cannot be unjust. Indeed, it is impossible that it should be unjust only if we would transgress some law. And that means that God would go counter to himself. So the only way God's saving acts could be declared unjust is if he was violating one of his own laws. And no human being or Satan or demon of hell can impose on God some law that says it's not fair, right? And, and that, that, again, is difficult sometimes for us to get our, our heads around. This statement seems hard and cruel, but it is full of sweet comfort because God has taken upon himself all our help and salvation in order that he alone might be wholly the author of our salvation. So also we read in, in, in this would be in Romans 11, 32, God hath concluded them all in unbelief, not with cruel intention, but that he might have mercy upon all. That is in order that he might show mercy to all, which is otherwise which otherwise he neither would nor could do if we would oppose him in arrogant pride of our own righteousness. So if we're standing there saying, God, I'm okay, there's no salvation for us. Why? Because we've rejected his means of salvation. We've said that our own lives are just fine in terms of let's spend eternity together. And that ultimately, um, you know, this, this quote from Romans 11.32 is a little awkward just simply because of the translation that was being used. Um, and I, I think, um, let me just look at the NIV here, you know, um, and for God has bound all men over to disobedience. So this idea that God hath concluded them all in unbelief is saying everybody is disobedient. That's very similar to all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, isn't it? Right? There's no one righteous, no, not one. So that he might have mercy on them all. Right? So that's kind of where we are here. And, and maybe this is a good spot to um, get into this piece, all right, um, and we'll see, we'll see what we get up over here, and then we get that up over here, 
So there's all of that. And thought about dragging that thing up before. Okay, I know where I'm going. Kind of hard to imagine how time is all present for God when we struggle so right we will and should I or shouldn't I do this and you know he already knows the outcome but it seems like you're struggling with the same things <laughs> often right and it, it's all in the present I know we're not meant to understand it but it, it's kind of baffling well it's it's one of those where there is nothing in human experience that would allow us to say, well, it's compared to this. It just mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Everything in our experience is bound by time. Yes. Beginning and end, beginning and end, beginning and end, everything, mm -hmm. everything. And, you know, or past, future, present. Yeah. Everything. And so to try and understand it is like well and that's the only way that we could have the reassurance that we are forgiven since you know yeah he knows the future of what our decisions are going to be and you know well we're and, gonna... and ultimately we're saved only by his grace mm -hmm. and here's where human reason just can't track yeah and this is where God is so far above us, right? Because here's the thing. If we try and figure out every theological mystery by human reason, we're dragging God down to yeah. our well, level of understanding. Right. right. And he's not at our level of understanding. <laughs> and he is not, you know, within the constraints that we yeah. experience as human beings and so part of it is at some level it's lord you know i don't get this help me to trust you right it's lord i believe help my unbelief you know that well, that cry of that not thought. my ways but whatever right. it is you want to do yeah. right do and it. so what we have in this particular document, okay, and this comes from a book called A Summary of Christian Doctrine, a popular presentation of teachings of the Bible by Edward W. A. Kaler, all right, um, and I've kind of excerpted him in this particular section. So it starts with this idea, and again, the, the, one of the things that I really love about Kaler is he will simply he'll make a very clear, concise statement. And then like, here's the Bible passage. Here's the Bible passage. Here's the Bible passage. Here's all the passages where we get this idea. Um, it, it just, what he's doing is he's summarizing literally centuries upon centuries of Christian scholarship. But, you know, again, this is not like, you know, a page turner. All right, um, because you have to really kind of track with him. So he says this, as it is God who gave us and preserves us our natural life. So it is he who not only wrought faith and spiritual life in us, but who also keeps and preserves it. So he's using a comparison here. God created me as a human being on this planet, and he preserves me by providing what I need, right? The same thing is true of our spiritual life. And he's quoting 1 Peter here next, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So God keeps me in the faith by his power. It's not my decision per se, it's his power acting in me. And again, from Philippians 1, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 1.6. That is an incredible verse, is that 
you know, God put my feet on this journey. And even though there are sometimes that I doubt and sometimes it's hard and sometimes I don't even want to be here, he is the one who is actively keeping me connected. And from 1 Corinthians, who shall also confirm unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And he says from these texts, it is evident that God does not merely start men on the way of faith to heaven, but that God also strengthens and preserves us steadfast in his word and faith unto the end. That's critical. In the history of the Christian church, there have been Christians who have taught, well, God gives you this gift of faith, and now you got to do it. Whoops. Time out. If I got to do it, have I ever done enough? If I got to do it, man, that one really bad day I had where I did everything wrong, does that now take me out of heaven? And basically what the scripture says is God has called you. God has gathered you. God has enlightened you. And God keeps you. By the way, that's meaning uh, Luther's explanation, the third article of the Apostles' Creed, right? You know, we cannot by our own reason or strength come to Christ Jesus or believe in him, but the Holy Spirit calls us by the gospel, enlightens us, you know, and keeps us in the one true faith to a life everlasting, right? Um, and then when he talks about the church, he talks about the Holy Spirit gathering us together. So, um, in that section of God keeps us in the faith, um, the exhortations, be thou faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12, do not imply that a Christian achieves this perseverance by his own powers, as little as the command to believe implies that man produces faith. So sometimes we can read things in scripture and go, oh, I got to do it because our natural sinful human nature <laughs> is always asking the question, how do I make God love me? That's part of my broken sinful nature. God loves me, period, end of sentence. Even if I'm Adolf Hitler killing millions of people at a whim, God loves me. All right. Now, recognize Hitler rejected all of this stuff as near as we can tell. And the reality is that that is the one thing God will allow human beings to do is reject him. We do not have the power to choose him because we're spiritually dead until the Holy Spirit works life in us. And then what am I choosing? I'm already alive. I'm not choosing to be alive. I'm already alive. I'm just realizing that I'm alive and thanking God for it. Right. So ultimately, what he says is sometimes people will quote verses like this and say, see, you got to do it. And he's saying, no, it doesn't happen that way. The powers called for in this exhortation are supplied and set in action solely by God. Um, now, Philippians 2.13, he just kind of cites that. Um, that one is one for his God who works in you to do his will and good. So it's God working inside of me to make this happen, right? As to the argument that since man himself brings about his defection, he must also be able to achieve his perseverance, scripture rejects the deduction. And here's a couple of other Bible passages. The fact that man is able to do one thing does not prove that he is able to do the opposite. Man can destroy life, but he can neither produce or preserve it, right? <laughs> We can't create life out of we can't create life out of non-living things, let alone out of nothing. Don't have that power. And if God has said it is time for this person to come into eternity, there's absolutely nothing we can do to stand in the way, is there? Okay. So you know, and again, I kind of like Kaler because his his reasoning is just very crystal clear. So here's another section. Man must use the means of grace. As man must use the means which God provides for the support and wants of the body, so he must likewise use the means by which God would preserve his faith. So if I say, hey God, I'm glad you made me, keep me alive, but I never eat or drink anything, it's not going to work out so well for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Um, matter of fact, if I'm not drinking anything within a week, I probably will no longer be here. You can only go three days without water. Uh, that's about it. You know, under extreme circumstances, maybe you can go a little longer, but it ain't going to work out well after that, right? Three days without food, three days without water. Yep. You can't go anywhere without Jesus. And well, that's true. <laughs> and this is what he's saying here, actually, because he's quoting John 5, search the scriptures. He's quoting Luke 11, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. He's quoting Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. From Psalm 1, blessed is the man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. While God could indeed preserve us in the faith without the use of any means whatsoever, he has not promised to do so. So people will say, well, I can be a Christian, and it's okay that I never go to church, or never read the Bible, or never pray, or never do anything else. That may be true, but God has not promised that it is true right? Um, it has pleased him to deal with us only through his word. That's critical. That's God's choice, not mine. Now, you know, I can try and be God over God and argue with him about that, or I can just say, this is how it works, right? I can try and say, God, I'm tired of eating because it takes so much time and bother and it creates all those dirty dishes. So I'm just going to stop. Keep me alive some other way. Again, not going to work out too well, right? If then we wish that faith be preserved in us, we must learn to ponder his word and keep it in our hearts. Whatever occupies our attention will work on our hearts. Isn't that true? That which we really closely attend to will ultimately impact our lives profoundly. Neglecting to use the word of God means spiritual starvation, spiritual suicide. The light of faith continues to burn as long as the word of God supplies oil for our lamp. Now, the reality is the spirit also empowers that desire to be in God's word. We can, however, quench or resist the Holy Spirit, can we not? Right? It's curious how many people through the years I've heard say to me, yeah, I know I should be in church more. Well, you only know that because the Holy Spirit keeps knocking on your hard-headed brain to tell you get yourself in the building um, you, know, you know or if nothing else get online i mean we, there's so many different ways to do it now right mm -hmm. i don't even need the book anymore to read the bible because you can get multiple versions of it on your phone so um we, that means is given to us now a difficulty. Here's where we start wandering into this whole thing. In this connection, a certain difficulty presents itself to man's way of thinking. Now, that man's way of thinking is a key phrase here, right? There is no difference <laughs> among men. They are all unworthy to be converted and saved. 2 Timothy 1.9. Equally incompetent to convert themselves and by nature equally unwilling to be converted. And then he gives us a whole bunch of other scriptures there, all right, that we could look at. There is no difference in the attitude of God towards men. He earnestly would convert and save all men, 1 Timothy 2.4. That is God's expressed will, and he alone can convert if a man is to be converted. Again, there's some other scriptures there. So do you see what he's setting up here? All men are equally corrupt. God is, in his essence, merciful toward all and desires that all come to know him through Christ Jesus. So here's where we get to the difficulty. From this, it would seem to follow that since the same powerful grace of God works on all who hear the gospel, the same effect would result. Either all are converted because the powerful grace of God breaks down their resistance so that no, or that no one is converted because the grace of God is not strong enough. For if the grace of God does not convert one, we see no reason why it should not do so. I'm sorry, if the grace of God does convert one person, we see no reason why it should not do so with another who is in like condemnation. So two completely corrupt people 
one comes to know Jesus, why doesn't the other one? Right? All things being the same. If it cannot or does not convert the second person, we see no reason why it cannot or does not convert the first. Where the same powers operate under the same conditions, we would expect the same results. Now that's our experience, mm -hmm. right? Since still we find while the spiritual condition of all men is the same and the converting grace is equally serious and efficacious with all, there is a difference in the result. Some are converted, others are not. That's the heart of it, isn't it? Right there. That's the one that's like, God, I don't get it. So here's kind of a summary. Um, and it's, it's what we've looked at and, and some of the other material that, can't, what, that went with this. No human being is able to convert themselves or in any way influence their conversion. God alone converts people. God's stated will is that all will be converted and saved. God's grace in his word, read that as Christ, right? Alone is God's chosen means to convert people and God's grace is powerful enough to convert and save people. All people are in the same spiritual condition, totally corrupt, right? God's grace is equally powerful and effective with all. There remains difficulty in the result. Some are converted, some are not. That's the difficulty. So through the centuries, Christians have tried to explain this. <laughs> Here we go after some explanations. Synergism would explain this different result by a difference in men or in people. Some people, it is held, by their natural powers, contribute something toward their conversion. They cooperate with the Holy Ghost, fit themselves for his work, do not resist as much as others, and therefore with them, the efforts of the Holy Ghost take effect and conversion results. That's one explanation, and that is called synergism. Synergism is anything that says, I cooperate in any way with God in my own salvation. And we're going to look at the dangers of these in a minute. All right. Um, Calvinism, our good old friend John Calvin and Eric Zwingli is, is in that camp, um, would explain the different result by a difference in God. Namely, that God does not seriously in, intend to convert and save all men, that he passes certain ones by his by with his grace. Wow. What kind of God is that? He says, I want everybody to be saved, but you know, there are some that I'm just not God. And I've deliberately done that. Right. And it's like, oh, I mean, when you put it that plainly, it's like, well, no, wait a minute. God would do that. Would he? Yeah. All right. Both synergism and Calvinism make salvation uncertain to the individual. This is the problem. The synergist must ask himself whether he has sufficiently cooperated with the Holy Ghost to bring about a real conversion. And I've heard people talk like this. Well, I don't know if I was really converted then. Maybe I, I think I am now. And it's like, I have good news for you. <laughs> it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> All right. And the Calvinist must ever be in doubt whether he is really among those whom God wanted to convert and save. So maybe I'm a good Baptist who's doing all the right things, but God really doesn't want to save me, so I'm going to hell no matter what I do. Whoa. That's tough, isn't it? The Bible denies that there is a difference in the spiritual attitude of natural man toward God or in the gracious will of God toward men, and it plainly teaches that he is willing to convert and save all men, and that only he can convert and save them. If any man is turned to God in conversion, this is solely and exclusively the work of the Holy Ghost. But if any man remains unconverted, it is solely and exclusively his own fault. Beyond this, we must not try to reason. And this is where we run into trouble because we are not holding things that are not resolved according to human reason and we don't like those things right and yet there are other things we hold that way right jesus christ is true god and true man all at the same time jesus body and blood are here for us in communion and yet bread and wine is what we taste and consume right there's a mystery there there's a tension there and this is the tension in this respect. 
we have no right to construct um, or develop a doctrine or um, on the basis of our own rational deductions, but we must bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and bow in humble admiration to the superior wisdom of our God, as the Apostle Paul did saying, oh, the depths and riches, both the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. That's a Romans 11 quote, right? Because when Paul enters into this, as he's talking about the nation of Israel, as he starts getting into this whole divine election thing, he ultimately resolves it that way in Romans 11. And that's kind of where we've got to stand. So again, um, a couple of definitions here. Um, and maybe that's as far as we'll torture our little gray cells today. <laughs> um, okay. Because <laughs> I this stuff is, you know, even for people like me who've taught all of this before, I've got to go back and go, all right, I've got to be very precise in what I say and what I can't say, right? If I want to be teaching what the Bible says. It, because again, some things are a lot easier to wrap your brain around than this. So synergism, salvation involves some form of cooperation between God's grace and human freedom Monergism, salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit alone through the means of the completed work of Jesus Christ, the living word of God brought to us in the written word of God. That, that, that's really the contrast there, okay? Um, and you could toss Calvinism into that thing as well in, in, in the sense that, you know, that there's something in God that is... Um, if you will, different from one man to another. So you've got this in print. You can go back to this and kind of look at this again. Um, I'm assuming when we have more people in the room, you know, it'll be like, well, what about this? Well, actually, let's talk about back here. Um, <laughs> you know, and yeah, see, and on my little recording, I have you know, not uh, kept up here. Although if I pause at every spot, people could pause the recording and go, okay, I'm read that now. Um, and so ultimately it's one of these things where this is one of those tough, tough areas in the scripture. And I think it's so tough because we don't have any context for it, right? Um, it's like, yeah, we um, we just don't have any context for it. So let me mark where we got to today on all my papers so I know what I'm doing. <laughs> the next time we meet, that's the story of my life right now. I'm, yeah, running from point A to point B rapidly and I just have to make myself a little that, that's why I marked my paper is the date of the next time we meet so that I know where we ended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well and I, I, I do the same thing, but I just I've got two different pieces of paper to do that on right now because we didn't finish 46. So <laughs> so there we are. Well at any rate um hopefully that I have never found an explanation on this whole idea of election by grace that it's like, well, I can fully understand that and get, wrap my head around it, okay? Um, I don't think one exists this side of heaven. Um, I find this set of explanations though to be satisfying enough to be sufficient, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right, because my everything in my experience every says this makes no sense. Right, it it does not track, and at that point I've got to go with the depths and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out, and go. That's where I'm camping on this one. <laughs> so um, good to be here today, and. Uh, Lord willing, those who are not able to join us are doing okay, and uh, we'll 
gather together again in the month of May, where we may actually experience spring. I don't know. I was talking to the Lord about that today. I said, Lord, Lord, please bring some warm weather. Would you? <laughs> you know, I'm ready. <laughs> um, and then I had to say, okay, Lord, I don't want to whine and complain. Sorry. I repent. <laughs> Help me embrace the gift of what he's given. <laughs> you know? Let's pray, shall we? Um, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good to be with you. And, um, you know, I think once we kind of looked at the whole predestination piece, Romans 9 will move a little faster. <laughs> so, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough topic. So, blessings on the rest of your day. And, yep, yeah, I'll just...